both now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. Let's start with a prayer. We have 62 participants, so let's start with the prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the power and the glory and to ages of ages. Amen. 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 Well, we are ready to begin our meeting, and I first wanted to just start by thanking all of you for your time this evening. I really appreciate this, having especially this, this strong of attendance, over 60 men from our diocese. This is what it's all about. I love seeing community, even if it's just virtually. Uh, on our agenda, we have uh, Sayedna is actually going to address the clergy all of us, but especially the clergy. So Sayedna, please, if you're ready. Sure, I'm ready. I'd like to share with you a story that um, I watched on TV the other day. It's an incredible story. Uh, during World War II, the British um, constructed a shelter 60 feet below ground. It cost them millions of pounds, British pounds. It cost them a lot of time, a lot of money, um, and a lot of effort. So at the end, once it was done, they decided not to open it up for the public. They decided not to open it up at all. And there was a lot of criticism. How come we spent so many millions of dollars? It can accommodate so many people, probably thousands and thousands of people. We can save thousands and thousands of lives. And the answer was from the British government is that we are concerned that the people will go into deep shelter and will lose their spirit to fight. The war was still going on. You see, we have been in deep shelter for the past 10 months. We have been in deep shelter for the past 10 months and it is normal that our parishioners are so sick and tired of this lockdown. It depends on your state. There might not be full lockdown. There might not be um, uh, lockdown at all in some places, but the lack of human interaction, the lack of traveling, especially for me personally. I know I used to travel every single week. Every single week I had four flights. So being in place is very, very difficult. Not being able to talk to people, interact with people face to face, socialize with people is very difficult that is not socializing with people. So our parishioners are tired of this and a lot of them are lethargic. They don't feel like participating. They don't feel like being active. So we really have a dilemma at our hands. We need to find out how we can bring them back to activities, how we can activate them, even how we can light a fire under them so that they participate. 
we might have to work 10 times as hard to get results that we used to get a year ago. We might need to work 10 times as hard to do that. And we should be ready to do that. Spiritually, we all, well, most of us have decayed spiritually, and we need to increase spiritually. So um, this is going to be a challenge, especially for the clergy, a big challenge for the clergy. Now, as they're talking about the vaccine, there will be a good percentage of the people who will accept it, and there will be a good percentage of the people who will not accept it. Which means possibly the pandemic will be over soon. And when I say soon, I don't mean next week or in two weeks, or it could be several months that the pandemic will continue and that will give, give us a chance to prepare to activate people and light a fire under some people. So the clergy have a big challenge at their hands. And the men, the Antiochian men, should be ready to help. There might not be enough hours of the day to help every parishioner. There might not be enough. So a good idea is to enlist the Antiochian men to help the clergy. Every clergyman can um, form a team of Antiochian men under the priest, under the pastor of the parish. And those can be guides to help the pastor in every parish, help parishioners. And those can be chosen by the priest himself to help him. It's going to be a lot of work. A lot of people are not going to come back right away. Maybe those teams can be formed to help the priest go visit parishioners. Maybe those who are qualified can help with guiding young adults or even teens. But all of that has to be under the care and the blessing and the guidance of the pastor of the parish. We're going to need every possible help to pull out of this pandemic. We're going to need every possible help. The priests are going to be overwhelmed. They're going to be called by so many parishioners and they're going to be pulled in so many directions, even more than usual. So this might be a good opportunity for the priests to organize our men teams to help them do this. To help them guide certain people that get assigned to them by priests. This role is not to replace the priest for sure. It's only guides that work under the care of the priest to help men in the parish, to help young adults, to help teens, whatever the priest asks them to do. And that's what I would like to activate in every parish. This is something added to the vision and goals of every Amen chapter to help their priest. 
So that's what I would like to say. And we can open it up later for discussion and see what we can benefit from each other ideas so that every parish in this diocese will come back to normal and normal being pre and pre pandemic. Um, as you may or may not know, even though there is a pandemic, many of our churches have received many, many inquirers, more so than normal, because of the pandemic. And glory be to God. God is using the pandemic. He did not cause it, but he is using it for the glory of the church and the glory of God himself. As you may or may not know, again, we are starting a new mission in Concord, North Carolina. Yes, within the pandemic, I am in the process of writing to the Metropolitan to declare it a mission and have a priest assigned to it officially. I have a priest and a deacon who go there uh, on Saturdays and uh, do Vespers or Matins and uh, Christian education and so on. They have about 86 people already. I've been working with them since early August. They have already about 86 people. They have 14 catechumen. They have 27 pledging units and they pledged $85,000 or close to $85,000 for 2021. So some cylinders are functioning well. Some cylinders might not be functioning well. So the cylinders that are functioning well need to help those that are not functioning well. We need to work as a diocese so we get back to normal. As you may or may not know, there are a lot of email messages that are going out from the Antiochian women, from the Antiochian men, from um, uh, the teens, and so on. Please, if you receive those messages, open them and participate in the events. The next event we have is the winter retreat, which is January 29th through January 31st, last weekend of January. Registration will start on January 1st. Here's save the date um, flyer. There are four different tracks. There is a set of sessions for the clergy only. We're basically putting the clergy retreat, which usually precedes the winter retreat. We're putting that, we're superimposing that on the winter retreat. So it is at the same time, we'll have multiple sessions for the clergy. Then we have a track for teen soil, same thing, specialized for teen soil. We have a track for our men, Antiochian men, uh, Antiochian women and the young adults and track for the kids, kids club. The DMC, the Diocesan Ministry Council is 10 people who have been working diligently to plan everything, including the winter retreat, including the fall retreat that we had. So the schedule will be sent out to you shortly as we finalize the speakers and as we uh, finalize the topics. This is the DMC. That's two, four, five, and five, ten people who are working diligently on um, the winter retreat. We have a representative from every organization. Um, Michael Bakleg is the Amen president, as you know. Shamasa Shel Khan is the president of the Antiochian Women. Um, uh, Suwana is the president of the Young Adults. Gabby is the president of uh, Soyo. Anna Sarah is a uh, Christian education coordinator. Um, 
Noura is the secretary of the DMC. Elias is the treasurer. Uh, Bryce is the social media director and Andrea is the uh, conference planning chair. So please, when you get the uh, schedule and the link to um, register, please register and urge everybody around you to register. We need to start this movement of reactivating everyone. And the winter retreat is the first opportunity we can do that. We have wonderful speakers who will talk with us. Wonderful speakers. The next event is going to be the winter camp. It's WAMP, as the teens call it. Okay. And it's not a regular WAMP, it's called WAMP Out because it's a winter camp experience outside of camp. And since it is on Zoom, we opened it up to the ages under 12, nine to 11. I know everybody is struggling and suffering. If we are able to alleviate that only for a couple of days, 212 to 214, then we should do that. It's President Day weekend and ages nine to 17. A different committee is working on that. Can you highlight that committee, uh, Michael, uh, through the website? Yes, I can. Okay, we have two committees that are working on the camp. The top row is the planning committee for Camp St. Tecla. It includes also Ted Worthmuller from uh, uh, Pensacola. He is right now in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, he moved there temporarily. Um, he was a seminarian, so he's looking for a wife. If you know someone, introduce him. <laughs> and then we have a committee that is the finance committee for the camp. Account payable, account receivable to different people. Uh, Father Alex is the director. And the top row is the committee uh, that is planning the winter camp. Um, Father Alex, myself, Suana Alter, and Mara Hacklin. Suana is from um, All Saints. Uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, and Mara is from St. Elias, um, Atlanta, Georgia. And of course, Father Alex is Myrtle Beach, Florida. Uh, Myrtle Beach, uh, South Carolina, that is. <clears throat> so again, this registration will start um, beginning of January. We sent out a flyer, we sent out an RSVP, to know how many people will join the camp. So when you see this, please encourage your kids, the kids within your parish to register for that. We are going all out to reactivate the diocese. There will be also a cyber spring retreat for the teens. There will be an Amen spring retreat. There will be an Antiochian women's spring retreat. We're trying on all fronts to attract everybody, to activate everybody. If you have any questions for a few minutes, please um, add, uh, turn on your mic and ask. If you don't have any questions, we'll move on to the next agenda item. So I'll give you a minute to start that. And as you, you noticed, we have a new website. It's called domsi.org. That's what uh, um, Michael has been showing. 
It's a wonderful website that um, Amen has been managing for the diocese. Uh, Father Hans Jacobsy of uh, um, uh, Bonita Springs, Florida is the webmaster. He's the one who uh, created the website. And Elias Abu Ghazale of Orlando and uh, Bryce Kirk of uh, um, Springdale, Arkansas are helping in posting events and so on. Uh, so domsey.org has everything on it. All the committees, all the ministries, um, all the videos. We're continuing to have the leadership, the um, not leadership, the uh, live streaming on Sunday at 3 p.m. every single Sunday. We've been doing that since the beginning of March. And a recording of that is posted on the website. So you can, if you missed it, you can go and look at it and watch it. Amen is having a monthly Bible study. Since the pandemic, we opened it up to all the dioceses. It's not just for Amen. And Father uh, Stephen DeYoung leads that Bible study. Is it every third Thursday, Michael, or fourth Thursday of the month? Yes, it's every third Thursday of the month. Every third Thursday of the month. Father Stephen DeYoung uh, leads that, and it is recorded and it is posted on domsey.org. So as you can see, we are doing everything possible to activate the diocese again. Amen was also visiting churches in the diocese and documenting each church. And all of that is on, on uh, antiochianmen.org. We have a second website. It's antiochianmen.org. This is the website that's being shown on the screen. Amen is very active, so many events. So we ask all of you to participate in all, all of these events, if not all, most, and activate your families and activate your church families to participate in all of that. Again, this website also was created by Father, jo uh, uh, Father uh, Hans Jacobson. Okay. If there are no more, if there are no questions, let us move on to the next agenda item. Okay, we are going to jump into some success stories, and uh, I'm going to start with uh, Mark, Mr. Mark Santana. Are you on? I think Mark, you may need to unmute. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. I believe you had a story that was recently shared in our newsletter. I was hoping you would uh, be kind enough to share with everyone. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Your Grace Bishop Nicholas, Reverend, Reverend Clergy, Brothers in Christ, greetings. Um, uh, just briefly, in late 2019, early 2020, I approached Father Philip um, to uh, spearhead a parish prison ministry. Uh, with his blessing, we began uh, that process. And uh, of course, as you know, COVID hit in early 2020. And but despite COVID, uh, we've uh, found ways to serve in prison ministry. And despite prisons and jails being closed and locked down uh, to the point where visitors are not allowed, uh, attorneys aren't even allowed. And one jail administrator just told me even people who are arrested aren't allowed unless they commit a very serious crime. So, so nobody can get into the jails or the prisons. So um, I didn't want to lose any of the enthusiasm um, or momentum that we had with the Antiochian men in the parish. Uh, there was a lot of interest in prison ministry. So we thought of ways, how can we serve in prison ministry without actually going into a prison? because we can't go into a prison. But we knew there had to be ways. 
One of the things I did was we reached out to the Orthodox Christian prison ministry and joined, um, signed up for their correspondence ministry where several parishioners now actually uh, correspond by letter with men and women who are incarcerated. It's a beautiful ministry. Next, we contacted the county jail. I'd served there previously. And our uh, the faithful of St. Ignatius is providing books and Bibles that we deliver to the jail and to the coordinators. And one of the things we're real excited about is we've partnered with uh, Transitional Home. Uh, as you can see in the picture here, once a month, uh, myself and some of the uh, Antiochian men go to a transitional home where uh, for men who were recently released from prison. And it's there that we have a community dinner. Uh, we share meals with them. Uh, we fellowship with them. Um, we're also providing books and Bibles for their library uh, in their new facility. And many of us just recently uh, uh, took part in a workshop, uh, a mentoring workshop, where we'll be mentoring men who are um, uh, formerly incarcerated men. Uh, next Saturday, four or five of us will be delivering Christmas presents to six children in the Franklin, Tennessee area whose father is currently incarcerated, presents on behalf of their father. So um, uh, an amazing way to uh, share the love of Christ in that respect. And we're also been communicating regularly with the prison chaplains for when the prisons open back up. So all that is to say that um, despite a pandemic, uh, we've been able to serve uh, faithfully in prison ministry and, uh, and uh, glory to God. Outstanding. Outstanding. That was a very inspiring story. Thank you so much for sharing it. I'm personally very inspired by your work. And I think you deserve a round of applause. Everybody should be applauding, even if you stay on mute. Great job. Thank God. By the way, Mark Santana is from St. Ignatius Church in Franklin, Tennessee. And when he said Father Philip, he means Father Philip Begley. Right. And also have, along the we way have three of Father Phillips in the diocese. Three Father Phillips. So we need to say the uh, last name. Thank you. Uh, and uh, also along the way, besides Father Philip Begley's blessing and support, uh, Deacon Edward Martin has been uh, counseling and supporting uh, every step of the way um, uh, through the prison ministry and has been just an incredible uh, resource uh, for us along the way. Wonderful. That's great. Thank you again, Mark, very much. Thank you. I wanted to, to shift to another success story. Michael Lieberman, I believe you're on. Can you come off mute? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Um, yeah, so a few months ago, um, we had the idea, some of the men in our church, to um, uh, to help out the, you know, the women in our church, or really anybody um, who needed some help, you know, going through this hard time. And um, a lady in our church, her husband, has, done, has been doing um, oil changes and different mechanic work uh, for their community of their church. So I thought it was a great idea for us, you know, to start, have our kind of our very first um, gathering and, you know, to support the church. So it was a pretty small turnout, but it was our very first one. So uh, we were pleased with it. Uh, all the women really appreciated it. And um, we hope to do this, you know, on a somewhat annual basis whenever the need arises and maybe grow from there. So. Great job, Michael. Hope everyone's applauding too, even if they're muted. I can see many are. Michael, can you tell us which church you belong to? Uh, St. Anthony in uh, Melbourne, Florida. Melbourne, Florida. Okay. Excellent. We have one more success story and someone that I know very well here at my parish here at St. Nicholas in Springdale, Arkansas. Philip Nelson, are you there? Can you hear me, Michael? Yes, I can. Please go ahead. Thank you for calling on me. Um, like, uh, his grace said it's difficult times uh but you know life life must go on and people in our community you know still still need our assistance um 
And so it's really important that we, I, I like how he's very said that to employ uh, and to enlist the, uh, the amen group to uh, assist our brothers and sisters in the church. So like Michael said, I attend uh, St. Nicholas Orthodox Church in Springdale, Arkansas. Uh, and recently we've had uh, uh, several, several people in our community uh, needing to move house uh, in quick succession. So three in particular, uh, most recently, um, one about 30 minutes south where I think we had five Antiochian men in attendance help uh, an elderly woman who um, lives, lives by herself, I think, Michael, um, and uh, just was completely overwhelmed with the, the formidable task of, of moving um, and not really having much support and able to be able to do that. So uh, we actually ended up making four individual trips with a U-Haul truck loading and unloading on a Saturday afternoon. Um, and which she was incredibly thankful for and, and otherwise did not have the resources in order to be able to accomplish that. So she was very thankful for the assistance. Um, my, uh, my family was also directly impacted in a positive way. My parents are in the process of, of moving up uh, nearby, uh, which is going to be a huge blessing. Uh, and they will also be attending St. Nicholas. Um, but they hadn't moved in 20 years. And again, moving 600 miles uh, is pretty intimidating. So um, we, we had the, the tall order of unloading a fully loaded 26 foot Penske diesel truck with air brakes, uh, just massive, massive truck. Um, and um, my mother, of course, needed a lot of assistance in, in unloading that. So we, uh, we were able to time it so that it would be uh, an unloading after church. And I think we had maybe maybe 10 or 12 uh, Antiochian men uh, come help us with the, uh, the unloading of the truck, which was incredible. And, and we unloaded the entire truck in an hour, which was amazing. <laughs> Um, and again, would not have been able to accomplish uh, without the help of, of the Amen group. Um, and then most recently, Michael, um, uh, spoiler alert, has just uh, purchased a beautiful home, uh, which he's very excited for, um, but uh, had, to, had to move a lot of things. And again, we had a tremendous support from the Amen group come out um, and unload uh, several pods and uh, really do some heavy lifting and um, get all of that unloaded and assist him in the move. So um, the, the turnout was incredible. Um, and and just the, the, the impact that we've been able to have uh, despite COVID, um, you know, just because the pandemic is taking place, it doesn't mean that, you know, people don't still need to go about their lives and don't need help in, in our community. So um, I've been thankful to to take part and to help out in the way that I've been able to. And um, also, my family directly having uh, been impacted and positively, positive, positively affected um, by the efforts of the, the Amen group. So thank you. For, Michael has been, done a tremendous job in uh, keeping everyone organized and rallying the troops. And um, so, yeah, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Philip. And I must also thank Father John Atchison. I was resisting asking for help. And Father John Atchison reached out to me and told me, ask for it anyway. I thought it would be a conflict of interest to have the Antiochian men come help the president. But fortunately, my pastor knew better and said, go ahead and ask. Ask anyway. Tell them I said you should ask. So thank you, Father John, for helping me to ask for help. Sometimes I'm not good at that. Um, that was great. Philip, thank you very much. Again, great job to all the men at St. Nicholas who moved three different times in two weeks. Great response during COVID. Really appreciate uh, all those stories. It's inspiring to hear these success stories. And what we want to do is keep this going. At, during these meetings quarterly, we want to hear more of these success stories. We're sharing them in the newsletter. Uh, I wanted to ask now, is there anybody that would like to share something from their church that has happened recently or that they plan to do with their men's group? Feel free to come off mute if you have something or you can type it in the chat. If not, you can come prepared next time. Hey, Michael, this is Chris Farha. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Go ahead. All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, Say, Edna and clergy and fellow brothers. Uh, 
just wanted to share this past Sunday, thanks be to God, we, we resumed uh, Teen Soyo Christian Education at St. George Jacksonville, Florida Church uh, under the direction of Father Kamal. Um, so that was, uh, we've been really uh, blessed and uh, entrusted to the Amen team to, to lead the Christian education of the teens. And I think I've reported on this before, but we, we are leveraging and purchased the uh, Faith Tree uh, Relationship Project curriculum, which is designed specifically for teens. Uh, we started uh, in May during the heart of, of COVID, and then we, we took a break for the summer, and we, we resumed uh, this past weekend on Sunday. So thanks be to God, we had 11 teens join, and we have three more that want to join so we should we should be around 14 or 15 teams every Sunday and we plan a, a weekly a weekly meeting uh, we've given teams the option to do in person or, or virtual over zoom in person we plan to do uh, leverage the good weather that we have in Florida and try and do as much as possible outside as long as we can um, so just wanted to share that Thank you, Chris. That's wonderful. I was going to ask if there's anyone else that has something to share. Okay, we're going to do this regularly every meeting each each quarter. And we ask if you didn't have something to share this time, please try to bring something in three months from now. Uh, next up on our agenda, I wanted to talk a little bit about our brotherhood and our communication together as leaders in the Antiochian men, and that includes the clergy. Uh, Sayedna, I think you would agree that our clergy is, of course, leaders in the church, the ultimate spiritual mentors of all of our parish, and always invited to these meetings and every Antiochian men event. What I wanted to share is we have a newly formed band group, and I know many of you, if not all of you, are already in the Domsey band group, and the Antiochian men group, there's separate groups for, for both, for the diocese and for Antiochian men. You can see them here. We even have a reading corner here uh, where we share quotes of the day, scripture readings of the day, saint of the day, even prayers. Uh, the Antiochian men group is separate from the Domsey group. But then there's also a new group that we've sent the link out several times to ask for everyone to join. And Sayedna, I believe with your blessing, shouldn't we ask the clergy to join? Absolutely. The clergy are men, and we need them in, in this uh, uh, group as well. And I, I think I may have caused some confusion because some of the clergy were not sure if they should attend this meeting or join this group because it is called Amen Chapter Leaders. But everything we do as leaders has to be under the direction of the parish priest. So we definitely want our clergy to be included in there. I have shared the link in the chat to join this group and we will also send it out in an email after this meeting. We have communicated it in past Antiochian men emails and newsletters. The, the purpose for having a separate group is this is really for our leaders. This is for the clergy, for the Antiochian men leadership, whether it's a president, a coordinator, or just a representative, a, ma a man from the church, our point of contact and someone that we can easily identify, get to, share success stories regularly, but this is just for the leadership. Uh, I think it also will help us to establish fellowship and brotherhood amongst ourselves as leaders, to get to know each other, which is something that's very much needed. Sayedna has mentioned this as one of his priorities is that we all get to know each other it's very difficult to do that when we can't meet in person like we want to so badly at the retreats and the PLC, all the things we used to do. Virtual is all we have for now, and we can use this tool to get to know each other better, to check in with each other, and just to be able to communicate and know who those points of contact are at each parish. So please, clergy, if you haven't joined yet, please do. I've already seen a few requests pop up, and I will approve those. Uh, as I see them come across. And again, we'll send the link. I've also put it in the chat. You can simply click on that to join. If you're already in band, it's a very simple join. You're just joining a different band group. 
You don't have to download a new app. It's all in the same app. And this will be a place where we can all keep in touch with each other again, share ideas, have fellowship, even if it's just virtually for now. And then also just help each other to be in position to do exactly what Sayedna said, uh, to prepare our parishes and to help in any way that we can to help our prayer, parish priests and to activate everyone in our churches uh, as this pandemic hopefully will be winding down. Uh, I don't know if you have anything to add, Sayedna, about band in general or about this group in particular. It's a brand new group, but I wanted to give you a chance to comment if you'd like to. Sure, I would like to reiterate the idea that this is a, a band group for the leaders in every parish. There is a president uh, of our men in every parish and the clergy of all the parishes need to be in here in case, not in case, we will be communicating ideas um, among the leaders. We will be communicating uh, the date of this meeting. This meeting is going to be a quarterly meeting. Um, and it's not only for our men, for the Antiochian women, for the young adults and for the teens. So this way information flows from parishes to the leadership of our men on every organization. And the information flows down from the leadership to the local chapters through the president of the, of the uh, uh, local Amen chapter and through the priest as well. Deacons also are welcome as well. All clergy are welcome. All clergy are men and are welcome to be part of this group. Thank you, Sayedna. And this is a brand new group. We just formed it a few weeks ago, so we haven't really started using it to its full potential yet. I've already approved a couple of requests to join, even as uh, Sayedna was talking. So we're at 29 members. I'm sure, God willing, we'll have even more uh, that are coming in. And then we can start sharing ideas, success stories, uh, communicating events. And then we, as an Antiochian men board, will really need this and, and rely on everyone in this group as we need your help to communicate things, not just for the Antiochian men, but to help our diocese to get the message out about the winter camp, about the winter retreat that's coming up. Uh, important announcements that we have, we would want to ask each of you to then funnel that down to your email list that you have of the men in your churches, uh, even if it's a Facebook page for your church. However you communicate, that's how you can help us get the word out on important announcements and events that are coming that we need your help to communicate. We're wrapping up the meeting here with a couple of things. You can see upcoming events there that we've already mentioned, but Father Hans is going to be addressing us here really to close the meeting. And Father Hans, as hopefully everyone knows, is the spiritual advisor for the Antiochian men, has been doing an incredible job in my personal opinion, and uh, I have learned so much from him. But Father Hans, we've asked to address all of us, all Antiochian men here as a part of this meeting to close us out. Father Hans, if you would come off mute, you have the floor. Thank you, Michael. So I've been asked to offer a word of encouragement. I think I can do that, especially with the COVID. Bishop Nicholas was talking about the bunker that they did not use in England, but I kind of think during World War II and during the Blitzkrieg and, you know, the bombs were coming and there was nobody saw an end to this war and many of them thought that they were going to lose because they were overwhelmed by German power. And so they built this bunker and like Bishop Nicholas said, they did not go into the bunker because they knew what would happen is the people would psychologically close down. They would get so into themselves, locked in ultimately by fear that they would never go out. That was insight on their part. They would never come out of that. That was insight on their part. But I think a lot of people, including some of the leaders, are kind of in that bunker. And that bunker is what? That bunker is a bunker of fear, is what it is. And when we talk about COVID, we're not only talking about the medical implications of COVID, we're also talking about the politicizing of an epi epidemic. That's part of it too. I'm not that interested in how it's being manipulated. Um, and I think that, that 
you know, the scientific facts about how it spreads and this and that, we'll, we'll, we'll understand that all later. I think it is re important to remember that it has a 99.9% .9 survival rate, unless you have comorbidities. And then it's, it's still, the survival rate is still very high. I think we have to remember that. But how do we deal with the present reality, especially since it's so politicized, some states are extremely locked down, some states are not, like Florida, it makes a real difference in your psychology. I think we have to look at it on a deeper spiritual level. And I think we have to understand what that spiritual level is so that regardless of the politics, we will still emerge victorious. I notice that when people are thinking about COVID, they default to the politics. And I've told people in my parish to stop looking for insight and direction from the news. I know a lot of people are watching the news all the time, but here's the problem with that. Number one is that we live in a 24 hour news cycle. That means you hear the same fact repeated over and over again. What happens is your mind automatically assumes that that, that fact has more importance when you keep hearing it repeated. And what happens is people's minds get flooded. And when their minds get flooded, they can't hear their heart. Where does God speak to us? He speaks to us in the heart. So what we've got to do is we've got to withdraw from the media. And then what we have to do is we have to pray more. We just have to pray more. We have to read the scriptures more. We have to do all that because when our heart opens to the Lord, I'll tell you what happens. The anxiety and the fear start to decrease. Why do they decrease? Because you experience the confidence that comes from God. But remember, it's the noose. It's the eyes of the heart. It's not just information. Information is, is, is important, but information is amplified, and that drowns out our ability to hear God in our hearts. Now, number two, number two, <clears throat> what does the devil desire? The devil desires that we are consumed with fear. Because remember, before Christ came, it was the fear of death that held mankind in bondage. And that's, the world operated on that. They saw no hope beyond death. They knew there had to be a life after death, but they were con con completely consumed by that. Christ comes, he conquers death by rising from the dead. He opens up the throne room of heaven to us, and that's where we're supposed to live. That's, where we're, that's what we're supposed to seek. Because when we do that, when our orientation is towards Christ, we experience that life and we are not bound to the fear of death. Now, I know a lot of people are experiencing that. And that's why it's important, especially for us as leaders, to see Christ more ourselves, lest we ourselves become overcome by that fear and that anxiety. And frankly, we can't minister Christ to people. And this is not only true of the, the priests. This is true of all leaders, of all leaders, because people need leaders. And the reason you're here is because we're all here together is because we are all leaders, even though we lead in different ways. It's absolutely necessary that if God has called us to this, that we be faithful. Because if the people don't have leaders, they lose their way. Now, this whole thing, the election, the COVID, everything that is causing such confusion in our culture, in our society, it's not primarily about culture. It's not primarily about politics. Here's how it works. There's politics, 
there's culture, there's religion. Okay, politics is downstream from culture. Culture is downstream from religion. Religion is what creates the culture, right? So religion is a central thing. And when we look at this again, in, in the most foundational and fundamental terms, what does the devil desire? Because there is conflict in the world and this conflict is spiritual. What does the devil desire? He desires to hold all men in captivity to fear. And that means this, that the battleground ultimately is not politics, not ultimately. It's not culture, not ultimately. It's the human heart. It's the human heart. See, all spiritual battles played out on, in a larger field is ultimately is ultimately fought in the human heart. That's the real battleground. And this is why if we want to win, and we want to win, okay, it begins with ourself. What conflict does like this and what pressures do and what hardships do is they compel us to move closer to Christ. It's the moving closer to Christ that ultimately also is the path of victory. And so if, we are, if we're concerned about what's going on in the world and we don't want to just fall into kind of a reactive shell because that's fear, but we want to be proactive and we want to fight this properly, fight this properly by doing two things, repent more and pray more. Because when we repent more and, clear, and straighten out our heart, clean up our heart, and when we pray for more, seek a deeper communion with our Savior, I, I'll tell you what happens is, is that the forces of light are strengthened. They are strengthened. They are. And that's how evil and darkness and even disease is defeated. That's how it really works. Sometimes we think that we've got to, you know, lead a parade or something like that. We don't have to do that. What we have to do is repent and pray more. Now, why amen is so important is this, is that the church is the body of Christ. The church is a continuation of the incarnation on earth. And Christ is revealed in love towards the neighbor. It really is ground zero of where the battle is fought and how it is won. So things like helping the elderly lady move, it's things that defeat the devil. Those are things that actually bring light into the world. Those are things that when we make the sacrifice actually transform our own hearts. Those are things that, that reveal our obedience to the commandment of God to love our neighbor and it brings delight to our Father in heaven and it makes you stronger. Don't forget that. If you want the confidence, if you want the confidence, if ultimately you want the manliness, if you want the manliness, this is on a very foundational level of how it is achieved. And that it's achieved in the church and begins there also strengthens your church. You strengthen yourself, you strengthen your brothers, you strengthen your parish because the church, as the body of Christ, is also ground zero of where all this happens. Now, here's something really interesting. And this is going to happen if we're faithful. And Bishop Nicholas already talked about it. If we are faithful through this trial, if we are faithful, this is what's going to happen we're going to see people seek us out. 
and your church is going to grow. It's going to grow because there are many people, especially young people and especially young men. I know this and you can, you can test me on this and see if, is, if it isn't true once this left, this lifts. There are many young men who are looking for Christ and they're looking for Christ in his fullness and they've tried the Protestant church, they've tried the Catholic church, no knock on them, okay? This is not a political statement, but, but they're gonna find orthodoxy because orthodoxy offers Christ in his fullness Orthodoxy offers a whole definition of the human person because they're looking for both. They're looking for themselves and they're looking for Christ and they've gone through so much psychic pain that they are looking for the place where both can be found and orthodoxy can do that. So in some sense, the hardship, the hardship that we're facing with this pandemic is also our call to be more faithful. In that increase in faithfulness, your confidence and your self-knowledge will grow. You will become stronger. That growth creates space for the Lord himself to bring people into our parishes that seek the same salvation. I tell you, they will not come if we are not faithful, because the Lord isn't going to bring people to us and risk them being scandalized because we are negligent or lazy. They're not going to come. The risk is too great. They come to us as a last resort. They have to find it there, but they're not going to find it if we are negli negligent and lazy because negligence and laziness is just unfaithfulness. And if there is no faithfulness, there is no blessing. There is no grace. And this is really serious business. But think about this. Think about what the Lord is placing before us and think about how exciting it is because if we do this, if we do, us, do this, the reward will be great and the blessing will flow not only on your parish, but in your life and in the larger community. This, I think, is how we face this present hardship. Now, again, Bishop Nicholas touched on a lot of these points. I'm almost done. But he said, we, we're going to have to work harder. And it's true. I don't think I've worked harder in my whole ministry than the last two months. I've really worked hard because that's what the times require. And I'm certain that is true of every priest. If, if a priest tells me, oh, I'm not doing much, then I'm thinking, yeah, you, you know, you better open your eyes because God is calling you to more because this is the times that we live in. Now, the reward for faithfulness is great, but it also takes a whole lot of effort, and you got to do the work. You just have to do the work. This is what is required for us because, number one, it's the only way we're really saved. If we want to experience salvation and we're not working, you're not going to experience it. I'm sorry. You know, you, you're just not. It doesn't work that way. But if you do work, then you, again, you open up the spaces. I'm speaking to all the men here. You open up the spaces by which God can bring those who are seeking him in. And our reward for that will be very great in heaven. So, so... You know, the, the, call here is to, the call here is to become more faithful ourselves so we can experience the confidence instead of the fear, because it'll be one or the other. There's no neutrality here. Um, the call is also to work harder. The, and this is 
Oh, very, very practical because as I said, the church is the body of Christ. It's ground zero is the local parish. It always is. The reactivation of the diocese is especially important because we have, we have, we're very blessed in this. And I've got a lot of experience with, with this. We're, we're very blessed to have a very proactive bishop who is giving us a roadmap of reactivation because we have the leader that we need in order to do all of this. So my, my message, men, is that, is, that, is that don't falter. Don't falter. Now is the time not to become weak need. Now is the time to fight even harder. And you resolve that in your heart and you put in the work you're going to experience a measure of grace that you haven't experienced before, number one. Number two, this is our calling, not only priests, but lay leaders as well, because the, pray, the priests need the lay leaders. They function almost like deacons, you know, they do a lot of the work, and under the direction of the priest, he's got part of the, part of the, the, the grace of the priesthood is that you kind of see have a wider vision of what needs to be done. He'll be able to direct you, determine what your gifts are, each one of you, and exercise those gifts and develop them. And then number three, the calling, the calling of, cor of course, and you'll have to pardon me, but I hit this a lot. The calling is to bring the gospel to those who need him. And our, our parishes will be full of inquirers a year from now if we are faithful with this today. So in closing, men, I say, don't fear. Don't fear. It begins with the cleaning of our own hearts. Then we discover manly virtue. We walk in that virtue, and then the, Lord, the work of the, God, of the Lord is accomplished not only in our lives, not only in our parish, but also in the world. That's what we're called to. Thank you, Father Hans. As always, you are so eloquent in your words, and it resonates with, I know, every one of us. I appreciate you sharing that with us. Father, we actually have one more success story that came in from St. Elizabeth Church in Murfreesboro. So we're going to go back to success stories for one more. If you would all indulge us, Father John Oliver, are you there? Yes, I am. How are you? Good. Thank God. Thanks for sharing with us. Please, please go ahead. Yeah, good. Thank you. I don't have really anything of substance to add after Father Hans. Father, my friend, good to hear your voice again. Thank you for sharing what you did. Uh, I tell people I have two bishops. I have a diocesan bishop and I have a domestic bishop. She who uh, orders all things and is everywhere present. She encouraged me to, uh, to share an initiative that we are uh, starting. Uh, we have already begun here at St. Elizabeth's and it is what we call the uh, the Boyhood to Brotherhood Initiative. And uh, I will try to um, share a screen if it's possible. I'm not sure if it is or not, but uh, yeah, okay, let me give it a try here. So what we, uh, what we have done is uh, I brought together several men in the parish for the purpose of asking them to, uh, to put together uh, skills that every young man should know. Um, our American culture does many things well, but we don't know quite know how to mentor old boys into becoming young godly men. Our earthly fathers could do many things well, but no man can fully equip a teenager a teenage boy to separate from his child phase of his development and awaken his own godly masculinity. So drawing from uh, the Amen group at St. Elizabeth's with uh, 
who are just like any of your parishes. They are men with many skills and talents. Uh, we're going to call upon them to mentor our boys in some very basic skills in making that transition from old boyhood into young manhood. So skills like how to read a book, how to keep a simple budget, how to change the oil in a car, how to treat a girl on a first date, how to build a campfire, how to throw a spiral, how to change a flat tire, how to give a speech, how to change a diaper, uh, how to relate to a saint, how to interview for a job, how to dress for the occasion, how to keep a prayer rule. These things that we have put together 40, 40 skills that we think every Christian man should know as a way to protect and to provide for those around him. And uh, so forgive me, I, I don't want to take any more time. Father Hans put a perfect capstone on our evening together, but uh, my wife did ask me to share. Um, Father, do you want to share your screen? I did make you a co-host. Maybe you can try. Yeah, I did. Uh, thank you for that. And I, uh, now that I look at my system preferences, it's actually asking me uh, to, uh, yeah, that's actually asking me, I would have to leave the meeting. Oh, okay. Uh, and come back. My system isn't designed for it yet. So uh, I can do that at some other time, though. Okay. Maybe, maybe next meeting. Maybe next meeting. Sorry about that, Father. That's all. Well, thank you. But thank you very much for your words. Uh, before we wrap up the meeting, I just want to remind everyone here something that Sayedna told all of us when the Antiochian men was founded. The, the ultimate goal is to become like God. And I think it's so important that we remember this. It's such a simplified way of saying that the goal of every Orthodox Christian is our own theosis, but in layman's terms, it's becoming more godlike. And we do this in the ways that Father Hans and Sayedna have said, by serving our neighbor, that's the only way we can know ourselves. That's something Father Hans has said over and over. We, we become more like God by attaining the virtues. Bishop Nicholas has said that so many times. I've learned so much from these great men in our diocese, our, our wonderful bishop, our spiritual advisor, and really many of the priests that I've met. And it's, it's time to put it into action. It will be harder, harder work, but it's work that must be done. So Edna, I wanted to ask you if you would make some closing comments and, and then a closing prayer. I'll ask Father Hans to close us in, in uh, prayer, but before that, I just would like to reiterate that we need to be active. Jesus did not stay in one place. He moved around. He was very active. And when he sent his disciples, he sent them two by two. We can send the Antiochian men to do that, to help the priests. So what I envision this to be is that every priest will select several people from our men who are qualified to help him, who can work with him very well, who can work under his directions very well, and he would send them to visit people, to help people in the parish. Um, I would love next meeting to hear some success stories about this. Father Hans. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. <clears throat> glory to thee, our God, glory to thee, glory to thee, our God, glory to thee, glory to thee, our God, glory to thee. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, it is so clear, dear Lord, that your intent, your intent, and the way your grace flows is to strengthen each parish in this archdiocese. And some of these concepts are new. The sharing of, of, of ministries, 
between priests and lay leaders and this and that, but Lord, it's the only way that the work can get done. It is also clear, dear Lord, that that in this present difficulty, we must seek you more. Our hearts must be purified. We have to confess our sins and we have to strive to overcome them. Then grace will flow, dear Lord, and your blessings will be upon each and every parish. It is your will, Lord, that all men come to the knowledge of the truth, and that includes us who are gathered tonight, but it also includes everybody else in our parish, and it also includes the people that you are going to bring in. So, Lord, I think that the message here tonight and the purpose of the meeting is very clear. And it's this, we've been called to something extraordinary. At the same time, it is incumbent on each of us to define, and you will help us with this, Lord. You'll show it to us, what it is that we must do, each, each man here, to develop the gifts and the talents that you have given him to strengthen the parish, by strengthening his neighbors in the parish, and also to create a space, an evangelical space, where those who you are preparing to bring into the church can come. So Lord, the reactivation of the diocese is actually the reactivation of the parish. And the reactivation of the parish is really your Holy Spirit filling it so it does become the city set on a hill, which is what it is supposed to be, a place of, a place of, of, of salvation, a place of real salvation, saving people who otherwise would be, would be crushed under the, just the tyranny of fear, never reaching what their soul longs for, never drinking the water because they can't find it. That's our calling. That's why you brought us all together. None of us are here by accident. All of us here are responding to a call because you, Lord, called us. And now it is clear you are calling us to a, a, a deeper sobriety and a deeper obedience because that's what's necessary in this present culture. The days of lukewarm Christianity are over, but the days of strong men have, has arrived and we are the men who are called to fulfill that. Grant us, Lord, everything that we need for our salvation. And grant us, Lord, the courage, the courage to go forward and accomplish, fulfill this calling to full measure. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father Hodds. Thank you all for your time this evening. And don't forget to join us for our next meeting, which will be in March. It'll be here before you know it. And please join our band group. Our next meeting is March the 9th. You can see it on the agenda there. And it's also in that band group to remind everyone. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again. This is a quarterly meeting. And if you need that band link, I'm putting it in the chat one more time and we will send it out on, e on an email as well. Good night, everyone. Good night, Thank everyone. You. Good night. Good night, Michael. I tremble for the fearful day of judgment. 
but trusting the compassion of thy mercy, I shall to thee like David have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy great mercy.